Today's date is Thursday, March 30th, 2023. The time is 8.33 a.m. My name is Landon Hatch, Marie Golisano Graham Archivist in the RIT Archives, and I'm joined by Elizabeth Call, University Archivist, and we are interviewing Dr. Ellen Granberg. In August 2018, Dr. Granberg became the first woman to serve as Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at RIT, and this past January, she was just named the 19th President of George Washington University the first woman to hold this role and will begin her tenure on July 1st, 2023. So Dr. Granberg, as we get going, can I just get your verbal consent to record this interview? Yes. Thank you. So first question, um, tell us about your journey to RIT. My journey to RIT, okay. How far back do you want me to go? As far back as you would want to. We okay. want to have some biography. <laughs> okay, so um, I, uh, my, Academic career is a little bit unusual in its trajectory, so I'll I'll start back a little a little earlier than a lot of people might. So I did a history degree at UC Davis, and while I was there, I was very involved in the student paper and uh, was in a in what was literally a coup. <laughs> I was named the editor in chief of the paper, and so I served in that role for eighteen months. and And in that, I I discovered an interest in in leadership and in um, and in management. And so rather than going to graduate school right out of the university, I went to work for Pac Bell mm -hmm. and spent 11 years there, uh, starting as a management trainee and then moving through a, a, a variety of different positions and kind of ending working in the billing systems area doing large scale systems conversions. So that's important to my story because at a relatively young age, I was leading very large teams um, and undertaking pretty complicated kinds of um, technological initiatives. Uh, you know, but the but the academic world was still always out there as a as a possibility, and so um, I did get an opportunity to uh, go back to graduate school, and I decided to take it. And so I um, went to Vanderbilt University. I did a PhD in sociology, um, got hired at Clemson University. And I was quite sure that I had, I was never going to supervise anyone ever again. You know, maybe a graduate student or something, but I was not interested in being a manager. Uh, but, you know, life has a way of, of tricking you. And um, after I got tenure, uh, our department chair was retiring. He... Um, thought that I would be the best person to succeed him. And it, it turned out the rest of the department did as well. And so I agreed to become department chair and I did that for five years. And then uh, I was pulled into the provost's office as associate provost for faculty affairs and then um, senior associate provost. And then I came to RIT. The other thing I should, I should talk about is just a little bit about my academic work. Um, so I was trained as a what's called a sociological social psychologist. So this is somebody whose whose main discipline is sociology, but your work is really at the intersection of of individuals and the society in which they live. So it draws a lot of psychology into it because it because perception, for example, uh, and uh, social meanings are are really important for influencing how behavior is socially constructed. So uh, so I did uh, qualitative work originally, so I've been the interviewer for uh, many, many qualitative interviews, um, but I also did some work with what's called the Family and Community Health Study, which is the largest longitudinal study of African-American youth that has ever been conducted. It started in 1997 when the, the young people were 10 years old. It is still going on with funding from the National Institutes of Health. And so that was an amazing experience. And so my, the second half of my academic career was focused on uh, mental health in African-American teenagers. So yeah, so anyway, I came to RIT from Clemson and um, I'd be glad to fill in any details there, whatever, whatever you're interested in, but that's the broad trajectory. So you mentioned being pulled into the role mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. vice provost? Department chair. D department chair. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Uh, so I was not thinking about, I was an associate professor, so I was thinking about getting promoted to professor. I wasn't thinking about leading or managing. Um, the department chair took me out to lunch and said, you know, you're really the logical person to come after me. I'm going to be retiring in about 18 months. Uh, and I was not excited 
about this at all. Um, and so what happened was as it evolved, I did, I, uh, there was someone who was very interested in being the department chair and this was not somebody the department wanted. And so I had a string of people come to my office and say, you got to do this for us. We don't want to work for this other person. And, and there's nobody else who can do this. You, you, you just have to do this for us. And so I thought about it and I thought, well, what would I, you know, I don't, I don't want to do this, but what, what would be worse, it, doing it or, work, or, or working for this other person? And I knew this other person was going to wreck the department. And so I said, okay, <laughs> I'll do it. And then much to my surprise, I really liked it. Uh, I I learned that I I prefer promoting the work of others. You know the the opportunity. I'm, I'll this just one. This was a very small thing, but the woman who's now the chair, the department chair of Clemson was a young uh, assistant professor. She was an anthropologist. We were a blended department. She was an anthrop forensic anthropologist. She needed three thousand dollars to collect pilot data to be able to apply for an NIH grant. And she didn't know, she, she couldn't find the money. She didn't have it. Um, and she walked in my office and she said, I've got this project and it's with these engineers and, you know, they have this amount of money, but I need to provide $3,000 so we can do the extra testing for my part of the grant. And the ability to just say yes, you know, and do some small thing to help this assistant professor, that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. And, um, and then, and I also realized, you know, it really matters when a department has good representation to the rest of the university. And so who your department chair is drives a huge amount about how your department is, is perceived. And so I also liked um, the strategy involved in making sure that our department looked great. You know, so those things kind of drew me in, but, but to answer your question about pulled into it, it was literally these people coming and visiting my office and saying, we know you don't want to do it, but you need to do it anyway because you need to do it for us. Yeah. Um, and in the end, honestly, it was a selfish decision. I didn't want to work for this person. And so, <laughs> and when I realized it was, it was that person or me, I said, okay. <laughs> sure. um, what, how did you learn about the position here at RIT? Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, we, at, at, at Clemson University, we had a new strategic plan. I had one of the other things I did between department chair and associate provost was I led the development of RIT's, of Clemson's strategic plan. And uh, one of the big things in that plan was to take seriously improving diversity and inclusion at the institution. It was a very Southern place. We had a new president, we had a new provost. They both understood what needed to be done. It was a great opportunity. So we built a big chunk of the strategic plan that was around improving um, enrollment of underrepresented students, success of underrepresented students, and a significant increase in the diversity of the faculty. So. Uh, our vice president for, D, for DEI knew RIT and knew that RIT had developed some of the most innovative and forward-thinking approaches to faculty diversification in the country. And this was under the auspices of a woman whose name is Renee Baker. And she held what was, until very recently, Donathan Brown's role in Keith Jenkins' organization. And she kind of built this whole thing. So we invited her to come down and train us on the procedures that RIT uses. And um, so that got RIT on my radar screen as a place that was pretty forward thinking. And so I had a positive view of it. And then it turned out that the provost at Clemson grew up in Rochester. Um, he was here until eighth grade, and then his family moved to Honeyoy Falls, and he actually still owns a lot of land in Steuben County. He's a forester, and he likes to go out and look at the trees and the birds and stuff, so he owns a huge tract of land in Steuben County. So, so he also knew about RIT. He had been offered a scholarship here as a high school student. He went to Clemson, but he was, so he really knew it. He knew it was a good school, 
And he had been encouraging me to think about provost roles. And so, so he nominated me for the RIT provost role. And I knew positive things about RIT because of Renee. And so that got me intrigued. I was also um, uh, aware that RIT was a STEM intensive institution with a really ambitious plan and that was appealing. So it, it got on my radar screen in, in those ways. What was the, I'm sorry, I keep asking. What was the interview process like? So it was um, handled by a search firm called Isaacson Miller. And you probably know that for executive search uh, processes, they invite nominations. Okay, so you get this email yep. from the firm that says, you've been nominated, would you be willing to talk to us? So I um, thought, so I said, yeah, sure. You know, I was, I was starting to get out on the market and I thought, why not? And, and so you do, you do a little preliminary interview with the, with the entry level staffer. Then uh, if you do well there, then you interview with the partner and then you get presented to the search committee and the search committee decides whether or not they wish to receive an application from you. And that is a wonderful thing because most firms want you to do the whole application, which is an enormous amount of work to even get considered. Isaacson Miller does it differently and I really appreciate this. So I um, wrote my letter and you know, in writing my letter, I got more and more excited about where RIT was going. And it was also really clear that RIT was about 10 years behind where Clemson was. So I thought, you know, I could help because I know what it's like to go through the next 10 years that RIT is headed for. So I was invited, this, this is the old fashioned, for a Zoom, for a um, airport interview, which was held at the Hilton, I think it is, downtown. It's the one right across from the Rochester Convention Center. So they put, they're not stupid, they put me up at the Strathallen, right? That beautiful neighborhood, and every really nice hotel, the whole thing. So they put me up at the Strathallen and then took me over to there, and, I, and it was a lot of fun. It was this big room and, um, uh, you know, and it's this kind of rapid fire question thing and all that sort of stuff. And, and, um, and then, uh, you know, two days later, uh, they, the search firm called and said, okay, they want to invite you to come to campus. So what they did is they set it up at, over at what used to be Venture Creations and is now the marketing building at, because it was all very confidential. And that was good because I didn't want people at Clemson to know that I was that I was interviewing. So it was a series of groups that came through. And I'll, I remember it started with Chris Licata and Jim Waters, each for an hour. The deans came, faculty senate had an hour, staff council had an hour, student government had an hour, you know, all sort of, so it was just this long day. And then it was dinner at the Genesee Valley Club with um, Chris Whitman, Ryan Raffelli, and a trustee who has now left the board. He, he's a really successful alum who had a company called, I think it was called Eagle something. But anyway, it was purchased by a, a larger, a, a large accounting firm. And so he had to resign all his board membership. So he's gone now. His, I think his first name is Bob. Anyway, uh, so that was nice. And then the next day uh, was on campus. And that was a um, visit with Lisa Cauda, who was the vice president for advancement, a tour of the campus and lunch with Dave. And I remember it was a blistering hot day in May. I mean, that was the other thing that everybody was really smart about, you know, no, no you did not come to campus until, <laughs> until late May, early June. Uh, it was a blistering hot day. And um, so uh, we were out on the, you know, in the, um, the little golf cart getting the tour of campus and everything. And, and uh, I remember thinking this is not normal because it was hotter here than it was in South Carolina at that point in time. So yeah, it was a, it was a good, good process. And then I had to wait about a month because I was the first of the candidates and they let me know that, you know, 
And, uh, and I do, the other thing I remember is that Dave Munson sent me an email about three weeks after I had visited and just said, hey, I hope you're still hanging in there with us. So I knew that it was going well. And he was just wanting to make sure I didn't have another offer or something like that. And I did not at that point in time. Um, so that was, the, that was the process. And what were the first few days like here on this job? Oh, my word. <laughs> unbelievable okay so let me think how, how did this go so we moved here and we had about three weeks before I started and I I started right before um, the start of the fall semester so it was like a August 15th and so the things that I remember the most vividly um, was that uh, the convocation was coming right up. I mean, it was two days later and I had to lead it, you know? And so, uh, I had to learn the script, uh, you know, learn the floor work, you know, do all that kind of stuff, do that really quickly. And so I definitely remember thinking this may not have been the wisest time to start. <laughs> You know, because you know something to, to get here, and then have to dive right into that really big event. And I also remember that I was um, too soft-spoken, and so they had a they had to really crank up the audio so that I could be heard. And so the next year, I had to practice. I had to go early and practice until I got the, you know, the cadence right and the volume right, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the other thing that I also remember um, really vividly from those first few days is that there was a, a, a big issue with w the wines of the world and beers of the world class because there was a law that was passed in the state of New York that created a conflict and uncertainty about whether or not we were allowed to, for the, we were allowed to have the students taste during the class. Now, I look back on that, and I know now, I know today how popular those classes are and what a important part of the RIT undergraduate culture those classes are. I didn't know that at the time. So when I'm on the phone with the general counsel, and he's walking me through the potential risks and benefits, and I just remember thinking, okay, because I'd gone to Davis, which didn't have a Wines of the World class, but it has a huge vitaminology program. I, I remember thinking, somehow, I don't think it makes a lot of sense for the new provost to cut off all wine tasting on her second day at work. <laughs> but the general counsel is like, well, there could be all these risks. And we, uh, and so I, I found a way to buy time, and I forget what it was. I asked for some external counsel's assessment of the relative likelihood of which law was going to end up. I forget what it was, but all I was doing was buying time because I just thought, I'm not going to make this, I'm not going to cut this off on my second day of work. <laughs> That's not happening. <laughs> uh, and then the last thing that I also recall was just how overwhelming it was to arrive somewhere where I knew no one, I didn't know the physical layout, I didn't know who I could trust, and it, I had not appreciated how much my work at Clemson was facilitated by the fact that I not only knew who to reach, reach out to for anything, I knew these people, I knew who was good, who would do what they said they would, you know, all those sorts of things. and so kind of realizing that there was a huge piece of capital that I was going to have to build and build quickly. Uh, and then there's two other things I remember. The other, another big thing I remember from the early days is when, when I was being recruited, uh, there wasn't much about the academic strengths of the university, but what there was, was about engineering and computing. But I had been taken to the university gallery on my tour, and I had been taken past magic. And when I walked into that university gallery build, building, that, that room is, is built to be very symmetrical. 
And so if you've ever noticed how when you walk in, it's kind of soothing, it's the symmetry of the, of the room that does that. So I was very drawn to that room. And so I started going over to the photo exhibits and the student events over there. And I kind of discovered the College of Art and Design. Like nobody had told me about this unbelievable, you know, kind of palette. I mean, it was just, it was the most amazing thing. And so it was kind of a love affair for me. You know, I just like, I just thought it was so cool. You know, and then I learned that we had all these alums who were Pulitzer winners and it was really, it was really neat. And it was also um, a lesson in how universities think about themselves because they, they did not put CAD forward in the way that I would today if I were recruiting a provost and that I believe they are putting CAD forward. Thank you. Yeah. So just going back to something um, you said previously, what were some of your strategies for building your social capital in mm. those first couple days on the job? Oh, that's a really good question. Okay, so what did I do? Um, so one thing I did is I, I had Pam set up monthly hour long meetings with every single direct report. So that was a big time commitment. I had 20 direct reports. So it was, you know, 20 hours a, a month. So what would that be? What, what's that? 16 divided by one, no, eight, a hundred divided by eight. So it's more than 10% of my working time. So it was, it was a big commitment. But I felt like I had to get to know people, you know. And then I also had her schedule those meetings, at least one, in the offices of these people so that I would go to their space. So that that helped a lot. Um, Chris Licata was enormously important because she and I clicked right from my interview. And of course, she knows everybody. and she knows who's good and who isn't and so she was also just incredibly important i went to a lot of events uh and um got to know people there uh but it was a kind of a slow process you know and early on i found you know three or four people i really thought were great and so i overly depended on them for a while and then you know gradually and now you know of course now i'm leaving but now i feel like i i really know but it does take time So as you see it, what is the role of a university provost? Mm. Um, So I don't know if you all know this story, but uh, there's a book called Provost. And it's it's a pretty good book. It's written by a guy who was provost in NC State, and he was actually fired from the job for a kind of a trumped up conflict of interest thing. Uh, And he talks about about this a lot, that, that, um, you know, presidents are number one. Provosts are number two, deans are number 1.5. And there's some real truth to that. So the way I would describe the role is that the, the provost is kind of the chief operating officer for the academic side, side of the house. So the, so the provost doesn't directly control um, very many of the university's resources. That's mostly controlled by the deans, although because the deans report to the provost, it you know, there's a, there is a, um, a relationship there. So the provost is responsible for overseeing the quality of the overall academic enterprise, meaning that, uh, you really need to kind of be Switzerland when it comes to favoring different academic disciplines that the, your focus needs to be on the quality of the overall student experience and the strength of the research enterprise. Um, and so it, it's that person who uh, who sits outside of any academic discipline and, and takes responsibility for the whole. Um, you know, the, the responsibilities on paper, you know, are the um, tenure and promotion of faculty, the evaluation of academic programs, the budget, uh, the role in reality is is a lot of time spent on finances, on um, uh, work with the president on development, and especially with the congressional delegations, with the local and regional um, uh, officials, the, the county and city officials and some of those kinds of things. Uh, 
it's a great job. It's a great job. I really like it. I really, I like not having to be so involved in the day-to-day -day operational stuff. What's your favorite part of the job? Hmm. So my favorite day every year is when the tenure letters go out. That's my favorite. That's my favorite day. And, um, that process of, of kind of shaping the faculty, you know, making the final decision about who's going to get tenured and who's going to get promoted and all that. I, I really, I enjoy that. And I feel like that's getting those decisions right is really important. Um, so that's something I, that I really love. Um, I really love the development of, of strategic initiatives. So for example, you know, we, we started RIT certified, you know, and, and the, you know, getting to start something new and, um, that's potentially transformational for the institution. That's so exciting. Um, what else do I like? I really like fundraising. I think that's probably part of why I'm going off to be a president. I really like fundraising. I love working with the congressional delegation. So those are the things that are, um, are the most exciting and, and kind of fulfilling. But what I also really enjoy is spending time with people. So like, I really like the weekly Dean's meeting. I really like the one-on-one -on -one conversation. I love things like this. So, uh, I, I know this is kind of, sounds like a trope, but I, I like almost every part of it. You know, there's, there's a couple things I don't like. <laughs> I really don't like dealing with the budget when resources are short. <laughs> That's fair. Um, what accomplishments as RIT provost are you most proud of? Mm. So, um, I think the the thing that I'm the most proud of is is I think I have had something to do with moving the culture at RIT around student success. So when I first got here. Um, you know, we, we, we finished our strategic plan in my first semester. And so by the time I got here, David already decided there'd be a goal about student success. He'd already approved the analysis that set the target at 78%, all that stuff. So that was all done. And it never occurred to me that there would be widespread resistance to the idea, but it turns out there was. I had deans arguing with me about whether or not we should even have student success goals. I had faculty coming up to me saying, this is going to ruin the university because if you have a student success goal, that means we're going to have to dumb down our classes. We're not going to be training engineers. They're not going to be qualified because we're going to have to make everything too easy so that you can get your, you and the president can get your improvement in six year graduation rates. I also had people coming to me saying, well, our graduation rates are low because we have five year programs. That's the issue. So, you know, we can't hit 78% with, you know, with our five year programs. I mean, I, I was blown away because I came from a place where the students were everything. And when you're in a public university, especially a leading public university, you cannot waste the taxpayer's money. Here, you also can't waste the taxpayer's money, but it's less direct because it's federally subsidized student loans. It's not an actual appropriation you're getting from your state legislature. So I was floored. I could, I could not believe that people were actually, this is like 1980 thinking, you know? And so I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> you know, like, this is a problem, you know? And so I did set about putting levers in place to change the culture. And so, and, and I think, I think we have done that. I, I don't know if, everybody i don't i wouldn't be arrogant enough to say i thought we'd won everybody's hearts and minds but i think everybody understands that this is a very important thing for the future of the university that some of the chronic issues we have can be helped by improving six-year graduation rates that in an era when people are spending seventy thousand dollars a year to go to rit that to be good stewards of that investment and do everything we can to provide is th that it really matters. Those debates, I think, are over. And I think I can say that, that my provostship 
was a time when that turn occurred. Um, and some of the big things that I did that I think I think were really important is for for one thing, it was in every dean's um, evaluation every year. It was in their goals every year. I told the deans, you get three goals: student success, research uh, productivity, and DEI. And those are the three things that matter. And those are the three things I'm going to evaluate you on. And I remember being in Dean's Council and uh, a dean said, well, why student success? The, you know, and they thought it was just about rankings or something. I mean, it was just, it was really something. You know, nobody argued about research. Nobody argued about DEI. But people argued about student success. I got emails afterward about why this was not a good goal for us. I and mean, it was, it was unbelievable. Today, it is not like that. Everybody <laughs> understands. So so that I'm proud of. Um, I do think I had a lot to do with getting us through COVID in one piece. Um, I think there was a big gap in communication and nobody was filling it. And the faculty were terribly distressed. The staff were really upset. Everybody was very frightened. And somebody had to walk into that gap. And I'll tell you this story because it is, I think it's important that this be memorialized. I did not want to be the one that stepped out there and did those office hours. But I don't know if you remember this, how controlled those original town halls were, where everything was so scripted and the media people chose what, and all, and, and, you know, people in academic affairs, they're not gonna put up with that. And so I was in an executive committee meeting with Tim Engstrom, Clyde Hull, um, I'm trying to think, uh, I'm trying to think who else was on that original, I forget, but for sure it was, Clyde was, was president, Tim was vice president, and they were hammering me that I had to do this. And they were, they kept pointing to Andrew Cuomo's town halls and how important those were. And they were like, you just, somebody's got to do it. You, you've got to be Andrew Cuomo for RIT because nobody else will do it. Not that part. <laughs> but do you remember his, his press conferences he would do? It's like, we need, we have to have that. So I thought, all right, all right, all right. So I'll do it. So we, we called that first town hall. And I think there were 1,100 people on that Zoom. It was something crazy like that. We had to up the license at the last minute, like call Zoom and get them to increase our capacity. And... We had set it up that I would answer every question I was asked. The questions would be in the chat so that everybody could see it and everybody would know if I had skipped over a question. And so I did this little update that was the frame we used the entire time. You know, what's the rate? What's going on in the county? What are the trends? Da, da, da. And then we opened it up and man, it, I mean, it was like, it, those first few were unbelievable. I mean, it was s some really good and thoughtful questions, some really hyperbolic questions. And then what was funny, and I'm going to tell you this story because I think it'd be great if this was sort of part of the archive, is at the same time that all those questions were coming at me in the chat, in, in a couple of cases, the very same people who were sending me the most vitriolic questions were private messaging me saying, this is amazing. I'm so glad you're doing this. You know, thank you so much. <laughs> it was so funny. And that kind of got me through those first couple. And then I started to realize that um, people needed this. They needed a place to get their questions answered. And so... And the other person thing I want to do is give a lot of credit to Sue Provenzano because what, what also happened there is people had a lot of questions that we couldn't answer. We didn't know the answer. So she would take them all down and she would go get the answers. And then we would do these weekly newsletters where it was all her work. You know, she was the one who would corral all these answers. And so we were really a team. And I do think that that and the fact that I said I would be in anybody's classroom at any point, you know, in, the, in that first year that I was on campus every day, somebody had to do that. And, and I do think that made a difference. And so I'm, I'm proud of that. And I'm very proud of the way we got through it. I mean, that was the whole community. I can't take credit for that. That was the whole community. 
So I'd say those, oh yeah, and the third thing is expanding PhD education. So we, we also, um, we won't quite double the number of programs, but we'll make a, a big increase in the number of programs. You. I'm going to jump ahead for a second, uh-huh. Liz, um, just because you just mentioned the pandemic. And, yeah, you know, yeah. Given your background as a social and mental health researcher, right. we wanted to ask, you know, what effects of the pandemic did you observe in the RIT community and how you think that's going to affect higher education going forward? Oh, yeah. So, um, I mean, the pandemic was just, it was just devastating. And I'm so glad we didn't know at the start what we were in for. You know, I'm so glad we didn't know because I, I think we all would have gone home and just locked our door. It, it was just so so early on. What I observed was this amazing and really inspiring coming together of the community to protect the university and protect the students. Um, I saw people work across silos like nothing I've ever seen in my entire life. And it was that I think was very, very positive. Uh, and that is something that I think has continued, is, is there's this middle layer of leadership at RIT. It's not the deans, it's not the provosts. It's it's associate deans and associate and assistant vice presidents from across the institution. People like John Moore and Melinda Ward and Sue Provenzano and Joe Lafredo and Larry Buckley and Chris Jackson from CAD. These people killed themselves and they turned this institution on a dime i mean in two weeks we were up 100 percent online the faculty you know just threw everything over the side in order to be able to help students finish the semester and so that was amazing um and this is very normal in disasters you know there is that incredible it's almost like a a rush that people have at the beginning and then things start to calm down and people start to get more weary and I think we saw a very standard progression at RIT Uh, and so then we were kind of that first year we were just sort of on autopilot during a lot of that first year Uh, but then we had to deal with the very real complexities of coming back and and that is well known to be much harder than dealing with the initial crisis. And we really saw that here and also around the country. Uh, Now, RIT was unique in the degree to which we kept the virus under control. And for that, I have to credit our students, you know, because they really did what we asked them to do. And not just when they were on campus, but also in their homes when they were off. And so that kept the virus levels here low. And that was great, that was great. But it also meant that we never lived through the high spikes that other institutions faced. And so that made it more complicated to come back, you know, and the fear that people had of coming back was very intense. And and so it was that second year, I think was actually the toughest year. The restrictions were still heavy. We were still distancing, but we had a lot more in-person classes. That was, I think, the hardest part. So now coming out of the pandemic, I'm seeing a couple of things. And and these are, you know, these are well known. Um, Every people lost their skills, you know, two years, largely isolated in our homes, very little social contact. Everybody lost some abilities do you remember the first time you drove after you'd been locked up in your house for a while you know i had really lost and i was watching people i mean everybody had kind of lost a little bit of their ability to handle the road you saw you know big spikes in title IX complaints all kinds of things So there was really a psychological toll and we had to get used to and rebuild our endurance for being together. And that took a a lot longer and was a lot harder, I think, than than anybody expected. That was true all over higher ed. Uh, And that was true all over over the, the country and all over the world. So then what specifically for higher ed? I think there's a, a couple of things for higher ed. One is 
the students who spent their big chunk of their high school years online suffered a horrible deficit. And I don't think anybody realized what it was going to do, uh, how poor online instruction was in, in the public, particularly the public schools, how poorly um, prepared we were to support students who didn't live in middle and upper middle class neighborhoods with, with broadband and, you know, fancy laptops that had high capacity and all that kind of thing. Uh, and so we see it now. Students not only have lost knowledge preparation, so they are not ready for calculus in the same way they were before the pandemic. They also, of course, have lost social skills like we've talked about, but they've also, they're also behind in executive function. So they're, they're behind in their, just their ability to manage their personal lives being away from home for the first time. So they, they've just lost an incredible amount. Um, and, and the question is, how long is that going to last? And, and nobody knows. You know, some people say, oh, even first graders, they're going to be at a deficit. I don't agree with that. I'll bet you anybody who was in middle school during the pandemic will probably be caught up by the time they graduate from high school. You know, because we're neurologically plastic. You can grow neurons at faster rates when you need to. So, so it, I, I think we've got about a four year window where we're going to continue to see those deficits. So that's the negative side. Here's the positive side. I think that the experience in higher ed and in education broadly in the pandemic was a resounding endorsement of the power and value of in-person education. You know, we, I think we all naively assumed that, oh, it's going to be just as good online and this is going to be the end of the residential college. I mean, Ian Mortimer sat in a, in a leadership team meeting and said, ah, you know, we really have to be careful because this could really be the end of residential education and this, that, and the other. And nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, now people really get it. Our students were clamoring to get back in the classroom. Uh, what we've seen with physics and math, I mean, you, most students just can't learn it in a Zoom class. They just, it, it, there's something about being with others that increases attention and awareness and it has a material impact on learning. So as somebody who believes in the residential college experience, that's really good news, you know, and it's important that we know that about ourselves as a community. So those are my just top of mind kind of thoughts about it. So as a woman in higher education, mm -hmm. you know, you forged your own path from professor to provost and now to president. Mm -hmm. What are some of the biggest challenges that you faced? Mm. So we did a panel last night um, uh, for Women's History Month where we were talking about some of this. And the, the biggest challenges I've faced have all been self-inflicted. You know, I've got the standard, um, you know, uh, gender identity that somehow in some way thinks that a woman should not be in charge. And so keeping that under control has actually been, been the, the greatest, it's been the greatest challenge. Um, I've been very, very well supported as a leader. Uh, I will say that as I've gotten higher up in the hierarchy, the gender stratification and the gender status uh, dynamics, they're much more visible to me now than they were. You know, when I was an assistant professor in a sociology department, I was pretty insulated from a lot of this kind of thing. Um, and I could indulge myself and think that I was doing it all myself, you know, which is bizarre for a sociologist to think. But anyway, as I've moved up, I've, I've received enormously valuable mentoring and support from many, many, many men. And the dynamic as you move further up becomes more masculine. And so there, it is more complicated. I've never, as I've gone further up in the organization, I've become more and more conscious of being a woman in the room. And so I'm noticing that things that I never used to do, I'm now doing, like, trying to be extra nice, you know, trying to keep people calm, you know, all these sort of st stereotypically gendered things. 
And and that's been interesting because you would think as you become more powerful, you would feel more empowered. But my experience has been the opposite. And and part of it is that when you're in roles where people are not used to, to seeing women, you, there is absolutely no question about it. You are judged more harshly than a man doing. There is no question about it. And so um, a lot of the challenge has been around uh, how to manage that. Um, the other challenges have been standard organizational challenges. Not enough time, not enough money. Um, you know, the in- increasingly complex uh, market for higher ed. Uh, all of those things are just, the, those are the standard challenges. So throughout your career, what has your personal and professional support network look like? Mm, yeah, so... Um, so I've been, I've been married for seven years, uh, but my wife and I were together for a long time before we got married because we waited until the Supreme Court made it legal in every state. And so we've been together, I think, 24 years. And Sonia uh, is also a professional person. She was in sales her entire career and then went into sales management and, and regional um, business management and so we've been each other's support a lot because both of us understand what it's like she's she was in a um, she was in the packaging industrial packaging industry which is a very male dominated industry and so she also really got what it was like to be a woman leader in a in a male dominated industry so we have been um really important support for one another um I have, I'm close to my family out in California and they've been important. And then, uh, in, in my early years, uh, I was, um, I had a very close set of very close friends I made in graduate school and they've been a real rock for me over time. Since I got into the provost role, I've gotten involved in, um, a couple of other kinds of support. So one is when I started at RIT, I hired a coach. Because I felt like I really needed somebody to talk to in confidence who had been where I was. And that has been enormously valuable. And I'm going to carry that into the next role. Now, this person is not a woman. It's a form, the, the guy I work with right now was provost at Duke University for a long time. Very successful provost. Uh, and um, so that's been extremely important. And then um, there's also there were there are also groups of provosts. So there's the Association of Chief Academic Officers. I sit on their board, so that's a support network. And then and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm joining uh, when I go to GW. I'm joining something called the, the University Presidents Roundtable, and it's 15 presidents from around the country. And uh, so that kind of professional mentoring has been really really important and really helpful. Similar question. Um, how do you personally lend support to women in your orbit? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's a few things that I do. I don't do as much of this as I think I should, but um, there's a there are there's a few things I do. One thing I do is I am attentive to the professional advancement of other women. So one of the most important things that happened to me in my career. And in every single instance, it was a man. A person pulled me aside and said, you need to go for that. So the depart- I told you the department chair story. I applied for this dean's role at Clemson. I wasn't ready. But the current dean called me up and said, you need to apply for this. You know, you can do this job. You need to apply. And this was a crusty old guy. He'd been a assistant secretary of missile testing or something under Reagan and Bush. I mean, like, not the person you would think would be in my corner. But he's like, no, 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 do it, do it, do it. So I did. I did. And I I didn't even get an interview. But I got calls from the search committee, individual members who said, listen, you know, we're so glad you applied. And we just want you to know it's only a matter of time before you're ready for this. So great that you applied. Um, and then when I went into the associate provost's off, office, it was a nomination and then encouragement from the provost. And then the, when I moved into the, to the presidential market, it was this guy who was my coach. And he said, listen, 
if you ever want to be a president, the next 18 months are going to be the very best time. It's the best market there will ever be for presidencies. If you want to do this, you need to get out there. And he said, and you're ready. And I was like, no, 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 I need a few more years. Said, uh, 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 you are ready right now. So I want to be that person for other women because no woman ever said that to me. In fact, the most difficult supervisory relationships I've had in my life have been with other women. And so I want to be the one that says, you can do this. You, you need to do this. And so I have really worked on that. Um, and I have uh, had those conversations with direct reports here at RIT. I've had it with people out in the um, out at other universities. So I try to be that person who who notices who's really good and who says, "Hey, you know, you might not have ever thought about this, but you should do X." Um, I do mentoring conversations. So I've met with many, many women here at RIT and had conversations about their leadership aspirations and how they might prepare themselves. Um, I've been very active in opening up professional advancement opportunities around, in terms of like professional development kinds of opportunities. Uh, the kinds of things I don't do that I wish I had time for is I don't do any formal mentoring. Not like long term. I, I'll have a conversation with somebody, but I don't do any long term mentoring. Um, I am not involved in any organizations that are about promoting the advancement of women. And it's just a time thing, you know. So um, that's where it stands right now. You know, when I retire, I think I'll probably do more of that. So what lessons did you learn at RIT that you'll be taking with you to George Washington University? Yeah, oh yeah, a lot of lessons, a lot of lessons. So uh, I want to, let me, so I've been actually reflecting on this quite a bit recently. So here's a, a big lesson I learned. And this was a lesson I learned during the pandemic. When you work at this level, you know, you can cause a lot of problems by trying to micromanage. A lot of problems. <laughs> and I'm a very particular person. And so I've had to learn at RIT to the level at which I should be paying attention to things. Because I will tend to notice little details that bother me. And, you know, you can have one or two pet peeves, but you really can't um, try to change too many things that are really outside of your orbit. And I've had to learn that. And that's a lesson I definitely want to bring to, to GW. Um, I think another really big thing that I've learned at RIT that I think is also, I will also be bringing to GW is when I was at Clemson, Clemson was like the wild west. I mean, it was, there was a crisis du jour. It wasn't a question whether or not a crisis would hit my desk. It was just when and what it was going to be. I got to RIT and I noticed about a month in that nobody brought me any crises. And then I thought, ah, oh, you know, they're just being nice. Three months later, still wasn't a daily event. And broadly, that has been my experience here because there is an adequate level of highly skilled mid-level leaders that know how to do their jobs. And there are enough of them that they can catch almost every crazy thing. And so when I go to GW, a lot of what I'm going to be paying attention to is do we have that layer? Is it strong? Are those people being properly supported? Because they will save us every single time. And I didn't know that when I left Clemson because Clemson was a state institution in, a, in an anti-government state, a small government state. So they strategically, excuse me just a minute, they strategically starved the state government, including the universities. And so and that played out in these kinds of, um, I, I know you need the tape. So they, they strategically starved their universities and their other state organizations. And so that played out in this crazy working environment where lots of things would lie fallow until they would blow up. So learning that it didn't have to be that way was a, a, a very helpful thing here. 
um, I've watched Dave, and um, I, from him, I've kind of learned uh, how presidents lead. And one of the things that, when you're at this level, you have to be really careful about is criticism is devastating when it comes from your president or your provost. Uh, and so at RIT, I really learned how to be uh, positive and still produce change. You know, and I, that's something else I want to bring. And I started that process at Clemson, but at Clemson, I, I wasn't leading the whole organization. So I learned how to do it here as that, as the, the organization's leader. Could you give an example of how, you, I don't know if this is an easy question or not, but how you were, how you were able to be positive but still producing yeah. change? Yeah. So one of the big things that, I learned how to do at Clemson, uh, and this is a, a personal philosophy, is, is to always be focused on the solution. You know, so when you're raising a problem, uh, first of all, raise it in the language of opportunity, not in the language of we've all done something wrong, um, and then move quickly from the focus on the problem to the focus on the solution, to the focus on the action. So let me think about some things that, um, yeah, okay, so I'll give you an example related to uh, student success. So I got here and um, everybody told me that the reason why the six-year graduation rates were low was because 50% of our programs were five-year programs. So I thought, okay, so then that, if that's, if that's true, then that means that the seven and a half year graduation rate is gonna be really good. Seven and a half year graduation rate was a half a point higher than the six year. So that that was a, a story the university told itself to explain an unacceptably low graduation rate. So I could have come in with guns blazing. Eh, you know, you guys, you know, you know you've been lying to yourself. I, I could have done that. And, and that is an approach that some leaders use. But I just don't think that's the way to do it. I mean, it's a fact. I've stated it as a fact. And so, and I, and I, but I laid it out in the context of, so what we know is that our students, it's the, it is not our curriculum and our co-op requirement that is leading us to have lower graduation rates. And then what I, what I told people, and this was actually not quite true, but what I told people was, I said, and so we've accounted for that in the fact that the six-year graduation rate goal is 78%. If we hadn't accounted for that, it would have been 82%, which is what it should be considering the profile of the students who come in. And so I made my point, but I didn't fight with people about it. And I didn't make them feel like they were wrong. It's, it's just a fact. And then I reassured everybody that the extent to which it is true was accounted for in the goal. So now let's move on and let's start talking about what we do about 78%. And, and that I think works pretty well. Now, sometimes, you do have to have a conversation where somebody's just not, they're not doing what they need to do. And so when you have to have those conversations, you have them privately, you get to the point, you don't beat around the bush, you don't tear people down personally, you focus on the behavior, uh, but that's just good personal management. That's not, that's not the sort of the more scaled public thing that we're talking about. You're the first woman provost of RIT, and mm -hmm. you're going to be the first woman president of George Washington. Mm -hmm. Why do you think we're seeing more women leaders increasingly advance to these mm. highest seats at the yeah. university? Yeah. So some of it is is just the the slow turn of uh, women moving into the professions and then and then advancing. Some of it is is just that slow turn. Uh, some of it is, I think, a growing realization that there are many ways in which women and the skills that women bring uh, 
can be an incredibly can be incredibly advantageous for an institution. And so there's just a general, you know, it used to be, and this is, I, I think the two of you are probably too young to remember this, but it, it years ago, um, there was a much more casual assumption that women were fundamentally unsuited to lead and that any woman who was successful as a leader was successful because she learned how to act like a man. And Margaret Thatcher was always held up as the classic example of this, you know, that she could, she could, you know, battle it out with the House of Commons just like any man could. You know, they called her the Iron Maiden. And it was that idea of she had a man's strength. And that was why she was successful. What I think really has changed is a recognition that women handle complexity better. They handle conflict better. I mean, there's a whole set of things that women writ large are not better leaders, but that women and women's ways of leading can be wonderful for institutions. And so it it's not necessary anymore for a woman to prove she's just like a man to be trusted to lead. So that I think has been a real change. And there's still a lot more room to get better as, an, as a society. And then there's another element, which is that there's a, a lot of pressure right now for institutions to demonstrate they have a commitment to greater equality. And there is a lot of pressure on institutions to show that they are willing to choose leaders that don't come, up, come out of the traditional, traditional white male mold. And so that has led to a lot more focus on creating diverse pools of applicants to start with. And then you move through the process. And, and at GW, just as an example, people did not believe that GW would hire anybody other than a white man. And they were blown away that GW chose a woman, chose a gay woman. Um, and so, and, and the board was deeply aware of that. I mean, I had conversations with the board chair. You know, she understood that. She, it, if, if a white man had been the right choice, she would have made that choice. But it was not lost on her at all that it was very advantageous for it to not have been a white man in terms of the feelings of the student body, the faculty, the staff, the public, all that kind of thing. And so that's another element. It's just another factor in the, in the process. But it says something about where we are as a society, you know, and, and it's, it'll, the pendulum will swing back at some point, but hopefully, you know, that arc of justice will just keep moving up and we'll just get better and better and better and more and more um, equitable. I'm going to jump to the last question, I think, because we're, we're running out of time. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you want your time at RIT to be recognized? Recognized or remembered? Remembered. Remembered, yeah. Word. So my biggest thing is, did I leave the place better than I found it? I mean, that's really, for me, that's really, that's it. Did, you know, did I, leave, did I leave the place? Did I play some small part in helping the institution get better? And I think I can honestly say that I did. Um, and I think the one other thing that maybe I brought to RIT is is an uh, an evolution toward some of the best of other university cultures. So RIT was a pretty buttoned up corporate sort of place. And I think Dave and I both have played a role in bringing some of some of the um the, the the approaches and assumptions and culture of the best universities in the country which is a messier it's a messier more dynamic way to run a university and and i think we've had some impact in in opening up some of that and and that feels important to me um getting through covid i think is always going to be attached to to me here um, and in some ways, I feel like my tenure here has been short because two and a half years of it was spent managing COVID. Uh, but I hope there'll be other things I'll be remembered for <laughs> beyond COVID. <laughs> um, well, this has been great. Yeah. So anything else that um, I guess just your as... questions are terrific, by the way. Okay. Just as a final question to sort yeah. of wrap us up, what advice do you have for your successor? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
um, get to know this place and its people. Um, get to know what makes it special and protect that, treasure that, and protect that. RIT is in an interesting place. Um, and this is related to your question as well about how I want to be remembered. So RIT is now a national university. And so it's, it's in a much bigger pond now. And so when I talked about bringing some of the best of the best institutions, uh, there's a risk there, which is about RIT actually losing what makes it special. And so part of what Dave and I have always focused on is how do we bring thinking and awareness and accountability to the standards by which all national universities are judged, like six-year graduation rates. Um, how do we bring that while at the same time continuing to nurture what makes RIT amazing? Because RIT is a university that is much more about the future than it is about the past. It's a place that broke the mold of traditional higher education in many ways. And there's no need to change that. You want to build on that. Uh, and so there's a balance. So what can happen? And, and there was a little of this going on at RIT when I got here. Is the we're unique was, an ex, was a, a justification for not doing things well. And so part of what I tried to bring was a joint focus on uniqueness and quality. And my uh, advice to the next provost would be to continue that. So at the same time that you're driving for more publications and better graduation rates and more sponsored research and more prestigious venues and all that whole game that has to be played when you're a national university, fall in love with what makes this place special and protect it and you can do both you can do both and that's what i've tried to do is to do both i think that's what dave tries to do is to do both uh, so i really hope the next provost will do both because uh, this is a very special place it's leading the way in higher ed it deserves more credit for that than it gets moving up on some of these national standards will help it get some of that credit but you still have to nurture what makes it unique there's no re we don't need another generic university we need more places like rit and so that would be i'm glad you asked me that that would be that would be what i would would say to the new provost and it's what i will say if i am asked great. yeah this was great yeah. really fun yeah. really fun thank you so much for oh your time. thank you yeah. and thanks for accommodating my schedule things are just really packed uh, yes. but i'm glad we got to do this yeah all right, I'm going to shut off the okay. recording.